that you don't care. <laughs> yeah. Cryptocurrency, crypto, crypto. I see so this panel is called YouTube on the blockchain. And I don't know how we're going to follow up Litecoin style a little bit uh, from the last Tough panel. But there. They did pretty well that last panel. That was amazing, man. That was the best walk off I've ever seen. That was like one of those like behind the scenes comedy shows. Um, okay, so uh, really this panel is going to be about uh, why YouTube is important, um, why influence, which is a term that's been pretty new, is important, um, and kind of what our role is uh, in disseminating information about crypto. Um, so maybe we can do a mix of like real talk and some jokes. Um, okay, so I introduce myself. My name is uh, Coin Daddy. Uh, I created this moniker uh, October of last year. Um, I've been in crypto a long time, since 2013. Uh, I've done well, I've had a lot of fun, uh, met a lot of interesting people. Um, I made this character uh, just because I had been liquidated in a bad trade on BitMEX. Um, and uh, I needed a vent, and I needed some art. So um, I thought, what would be more interesting than creating a persona? So I created this persona called Coin Daddy, and I realized that that name alone wasn't enough, and I needed something to differentiate myself. So, I'm going to take my SEC hat off, okay, <laughs> and I'm going to put on, dun 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 Okay, so literally, check this out. I, yeah, can you hold this one second? I never know what's more authentic, the names that we make up or the names that our parents make up for us, because I think this is more authentic. So I identify as Coin Daddy on the weekends. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically I created this character um, and uh, I started putting out songs online. Um, and then uh, it went viral. Um, and uh, I performed at the um, San Francisco uh, Bitcoin meetup and uh, the New York Times was there. And they came and they saw me and they said, you know, you're the most interesting character. Like, what is this? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, this is what Bitcoin people look like, you know? She's, oh, really? Cool. Uh, so they took a photo. A few weeks went by. Nothing happened. Um, and then my phone just like started vibrating off of my dresser one morning. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm not that cool. Like, <laughs> so what's going on here? And then I look at it. It's like, dude, you're in the New York Times. And I'm like, what do you mean? And I go look, and there's like a photo of me literally like this in front of a computer with like a leg sprawled out. And then at that point, I was coined daddy. Sorry, mom. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so then a YouTube persona was created. Um, and, uh, yeah, and ever since then, we've taken it and we've run. And hopefully I've been uh, using it for good. So that's my story. Uh, that's my self, uh, shameless self-promotion. Um, and now I want to pass it over to my wonderful panelists so they can introduce themselves, and then we can get into the questions. All right. So first off, how's everyone doing? Good. Awesome. Uh, my name's Ryan Rotolo, also known as CryptoFiend on social media. Um, I started getting into cryptocurrencies probably in the beginning of 2017, and I started my uh, YouTube channel in October of 2017. Uh, my channel's really based around news revolving around cryptocurrencies, tutorials, uh, really kind of like beginner stuff for all of you guys that aren't greatly familiar. Uh, so yeah, you can go check me out over there, um, and yeah. I'm a rather simple guy, so I'm going to pass it on over. You don't have simple socks on. For those who can't see, there's yeah, phenomenal yeah. socks. Those are not the socks of a simple man. I on. Figured I'd spice it up. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris DeRose. I do the Bitcoin <laughs> Uncensored show on Did YouTube. You and I've been doing cryptocurrency, uh, geez, many years now. I started in 2011. Uh, I got more active in 2013. And really, looking at this conference actually has been kind of uh, hearkening back to some of the earlier days. I, I think that I've been to so many suit conventions, and like they're good for what they are, but this is more grassroots. This is, frankly, a lot more fun for me. But how many pimp suit conventions are there? I have not been to any pimp suit conventions. Other <laughs> You're than out. <laughs> maybe this one here. I don't know. Maybe it's been transformed. So it's great to see you guys here. I don't know uh, what your background is in the space, but I like covering the capers, the hilarity, the nonsense and the future uh, in equal proportions. I do a lot of politics coverage in this space, but this being Bitcoin, it's him suit politics, which makes for some weird content. Fake news. Can. Fake news. All right, what's up, guys? My name is Patrick. Um, I just run my channel, just Patrick Corsino. I don't have a cool name like everyone else. I talk about news. Uh, I do some trading. It's basically whatever I'm, I'm up to at the time. So a lot of beginner-friendly stuff. And yeah, I, I got in. I think I started my channel like December 2017. So at the top of the bull run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's up, everybody? My name is Jay Sweeps. Uh, I host Coin Stories. 
I'm all about the narratives of, of cryptocurrencies and the people who are building the projects. So I'm constantly trying to interview and, and kind of get an idea of what the project's about, what the, the story is behind it. Um, because I am a much bigger believer in buying and holding for a long time. I don't day trade at all. You're not going to find that on my channel. Uh, but storytelling and th the reasons why people are building their projects is entirely what I focus on on Coin Stories. Cool. Uh, so my name is Nathan Lerng. Uh, I work in film and movie production. Worked on a lot of commercials, some Super Bowl spots. I fell into crypto in 2017. My friend said, put everything into ETH. I did. And everything into ETH, wrote it up, wrote it all the way back down. And yeah, uh, so I was with Cryptonauts for a little while. We do a lot of videos and actually we're jumping ship. Um, not going to talk about it, but I guess I'll just announce it. Uh, we are now part of Altcoin Buzz. So we're going to shoot our first video today. So what I want to do is just ask everybody, you know, what their favorite is and what they would not invest in and then just plug everybody in, put their tags, put their, you know, YouTube channel, put their, their Twitter and just really unify the space. I feel like there's a lot of problems with beef and a lot of drama. And this is a niche market, just like Hollywood is already. And we don't need that, you know. So, yeah. That's that's who I am. So guys, uh, let's start it off with a, a question to set the tone, make it relevant. Why is YouTube or being an influencer important to spreading the message about cryptocurrency? And then if you want to f add an extra question onto it, what made you decide to go down this route? So personally for me, I think YouTube is obviously it's the biggest videography platform in the world. Um, and this new day and era that we live in where everyone's on social media, everyone's online in some way, um, people don't always like to, you know, open up a book and read and read an article or whatever. So I feel like YouTube's a big part of cryptocurrencies in that sense of being able to learn what's what, you know, whether it's a review, a tutorial. Uh, it's definitely the place the majority of people go to. So it's uh, awesome to have a lot of influencers on the platform that are reputable, credible, um, and I think, uh, what was the second question? Why did you decide to go down this route? Why did I jump into this interesting roller coaster? Um, to be honest, I, I probably... Low, the, low self-esteem is not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw the hype around it back in... Uh, probably around September <laughs> of 2017. Uh, I always knew about Bitcoin, but not enough. Got in around 2017, saw a lot of YouTubers coming up, and I figured I'd give it a shot, and it worked out rather well, I'd say. Uh, so yeah, that's why I got involved. And it is a revolution, so this is the beginning. YouTube is the place that most people start in this space. It's where they go to get a question answered, the questions are very interesting, I think, in the earliest stages. What, you know, what is Bitcoin? What is money? And it, it gets very personal from there, even. Like, I think the role of the search engine now has kind of been like the confessional in some senses, where you go and you like confess the questions you're not allowed to ask in public, even. And then as YouTubers, we have to, I think, take a look at this and provide meaning to the people that come. And we end up being ambassadors for the brands and ambassadors, I think, uh, to uh, the just general uh, public that has strange questions sometimes, and we then uh, slip into that sort of consciousness and guide them around the space from there. Follow-up question to you specifically. Was this created originally to serve other people, or was this created for you as a self-expression that grew into serving other people? Yeah, when I started, I didn't know any of that. I was just I just turned on a camera one day, and I, saw, I thought I'd see who the hell showed up. And, I, and I've been doing this for a while. I didn't really receive any training of any kind, or really a lot of us didn't. Nobody kind of sat down. And then over time, you, le you learn the patterns. Because like, I think it's maybe um, opaque to some of you, but uh, when you are on your side of the table and we are on our side of the table, there isn't a lot of communication. So I don't know necessarily what goes on in other people's heads when they're coming to my content, uh, other than through trial and error, and you see comments and refine from there. But um, I, I think for me, it was as much a way of expanding my social network at first to include more people in it and understand, I think, myself. And now that I have more experience than most people, I see it a little bit different. Um, I see it as sort of how people um, can find a home or footing or place in a chaotic world that they arrived with. 
Um, and it's interesting because in blockchain, I think people have like a need to find some kind of meaning in terms of money or, or investment or you know any any sort of community aspect. And so for us YouTubers, we have to I think present to them what it is that we offer here. And I think that's why it's important. Is it anchors people in some sense of uh, their place in the online world and in modern society. And uh, it's a real privilege to be able to help people with that. Yeah, I think the important thing is you're not going to learn any of this stuff in school for the next like 10 years by the time it like fits in there. So you have to have a place to go to get good information from good people. And there's a ton of terrible like people in the space. There's a lot of terrible projects in the space. I'm sure everyone knows. So you have to kind of filter it out. The bear market has taken out a bunch of the YouTubers. Uh, we were talking about this, all the YouTubers the other day, like a ton of people have left who weren't in it for the right reasons. And the reason I got started was more to hold myself accountable. Uh, it's kind of to keep up with the information. Otherwise I knew I'd probably just like drift off and not follow stuff. So if I, 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 if I had to make videos every day, I'd have to be up to date about the situation. So. That's why I got started. Yeah, I have a follow-up question for you. So you mentioned this is where people get their information now, right? So do you think there's almost like an alternative school that's happening in parallel to like main education where people can choose the things that they want to learn about and choose who they want to learn it from? Yeah, so this is like a different topic. I can go on for a while, but I think it's pr pr probably not parallel. I'd say it's more important than school um, because you can get direct access to the information you want to learn rather than have to go through the classes you don't really like care about. So do you guys all remember the beginning of YouTube over time, right? And we've seen it's only gotten more and more popular. Yeah. And then we have tutorial videos and unboxing videos and now even like girls are learning how to put makeup on from a super young age, right? So everything's becoming advanced and faster. Do you think this trend is just going to continue and maybe people will start to learn through like Khan Academy, YouTube, etc. all of the things they want to about money, about crypto, about Litecoin? 100%. I mean, I go to school and I know I use Khan Academy still, so it's like I have to go there to learn the stuff that my t like that my professor couldn't teach me because it was easier to learn from them. So I think using that like it's going to be a big space. It's going to continue to grow. I th you're going to get more and more stuff on there. You get direct access to your information. Then you get to meet like someone you're following for that information, and you trust them. You build a relationship with them, and yeah, th I, I think it's going to be it's going to continue to grow. So YouTubers are the teachers of tomorrow. Hell yeah. <laughs> Um, I started uh, my YouTube channel purely out of wanting to record myself while I was doing research. And all of a sudden I did a live stream and it just started building and people liked it, started developing relationships. And uh, around December or so, I got an email from somebody who had been watching me. I didn't even know that they had my email address and said that they took some information I had and had given them and took a hundred bucks, turned it into a thousand dollars. And that was the first time they were able to give their family Christmas in years. And I literally just felt chills go through my body. I was working at Apple at the time, and I just went the next day and quit and decided, you know what, I'm going to go full time into YouTube. Don't make nearly as much as I was making at Apple, but I am more fulfilled than I could have ever been. And I have time. I get to do what I want when I wake up, and then I get to redistribute that message that I find throughout the day to whoever wants to find it with me. So that's why I do YouTube, purely love of sharing whatever I can find with whoever wants to listen. Word. I feel it. Uh, no, so our first video, no, for real, I do, I do, I really do. Uh, our first video, we shot it in a park um, down the street from my place. We had our little piece of wood monopod, just, you know, DSLR, and then use the iPhone for sound, put it in my pocket, <laughs> memorize the script, the director would just read it right to camera. And then we animated it, and he put it out. We got like 5,000 views. We're like, okay. You know, all right, let's do another. And then it got like, you know, 100,000, 50,000. We're like, what? All right, so we do it full time. And then um, slowly I jumped into the, and I fell down the rabbit hole, and I just started researching. And I realized that, you know, as influencers, we have this responsibility to our audience. Um, we have a responsibility to tell them the truth and to ask the questions that they cannot ask. Because if we're, going to invest in a project, let's say you're going to invest in a project or you're going to invest in a project and you, you're just like a regular individual investor and I'm talking to the CEO of a company that's coming out, I'm going to have to ask those questions on behalf of you guys, not what I want, not to be friends with them. I have to be unbiased because if they're going to screw everybody over, that's on us and that's our responsibility. Yeah. So I, I think one thing that I'm noticing even just uh, in this panel is helping me grow and learn too about kind of the integrity that we put into our craft. Um, and it seems like really these are the people and we are the people that are teaching uh, people who want to learn about crypto or whatever it is. 
Um, so I guess that's a good lead into the next question, which is for someone who is in the audience, right, and they want to get this information, what do you think they should look for when choosing who to listen to? And, and how do you think they can best effectively use the content that we're putting out here uh, like to better their own lives? And anybody can take it. It's an open question to the panel. Uh, so I... I think okay. uh, I think a big a big way in knowing if say you're you you want to follow an influencer it's not necessarily all about the numbers I mean we've seen that in the past we had a handful of not so great influencers with big numbers on the screen uh, it's more about the content that they produ produce honestly if it's educational uh, I mean if they're you know shilling a bunch of stuff all the time that's not necessarily a good look um, but if you're learning from them and you can apply that to your own skills in cryptocurrencies, I think that's a the, the main factor. You know, I, I, I thought of a better way to phrase this question. Is It's when you guys, what do you look for uh, when you watch a, a YouTuber? First of all, do you watch YouTubers? Anybody? Okay. So everybody, right? Wow, so so what do you look for in the YouTubers that you kind of find a resonance with? And anybody can just throw it out. Someone who talks in regular voice. 100%. Do people not talk in their regular voice? Is that? Welcome to my channel. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the one thing that Content, I always right? make a point to do. And Pride yourself on being exactly who you are 100% of the time. That's so, what Chris has been saying the whole time. So she said content, and I heard someone say someone who's not boring. So I'm wondering, like, is it the person that you're learning from, or is it what they're saying? Does anyone have a disagreeing opinion to that? It's YouTubers up front. <laughs> I want to hear what Love has to say. They have to have a sexy beard. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Well, nobody can compete with you, you know. <laughs> I'm growing it. I'm a little reminded, I think, in this discussion of like what Steve Jobs tells us about the iPhone, which is if you ask everyone in this room what kind of phone they might have wanted, uh, they would have all had a separate phone, except it is the job, I think, of the producer to tell them perhaps what is the law of physics and what we can actually accommodate and then provide the phone and then if they do a good job they'll know it but it's always hard i think to ask the viewers to know what it is they want so the what type of like, metaphorical phone would you provide yeah okay <laughs> hard question i mean i try to be a peer with people uh, in my audience i don't know if that's even the best strategy but my like sensitivities go up when i see people who are uh, i think talking from a position as an oracle or the knower or the person who has like hidden information of the universe like but, vinnie lingam well, he's definitely famous for it, but it, this, that's the thing in this space, it's very weird. The people that often do that are very successful, so I, I think of people like even Vitalik did that for a good while, uh, that clearly worked for him, where he was like this affected seer and he had the secret knowledge. But I don't know that that's actually the way that people should be uh, absorbing information necessarily. Personally, I think, find somebody who you can relate to and interact with, because I think that makes the most of the YouTube medium and what makes it different than like traditional network television formats, where you're being talk it, talked at as opposed to talked with. That's what I would recommend. I don't always know that that's what everybody else wants. No, yeah, to add something, I think it depends a lot on who's watching. Like, some people prefer the entertainment and the info. Some people just prefer just info. Just like some people want to see trading, some people want to see news. Like, a lot of people here have very different personalities, and I think the people that follow, the people that watch, just prefer that personality. The one thing that I'm always looking for is engagement with any of the audience. So, as a viewer, if I go on their live stream and I start talking to them and I go on their Twitter and I start talking to them and they, they're responding to me, that, that gives them more credibility in, in my eyes immediately. So I've made a point from learning from all these great people around me to do that. Engage with everyone. There's not a moment that's too big for you to say, hi, I can help you. If I can, I'm here for you. Yeah, uh, I second that because I feel like if you put your money where your mouth is, right? So if you're too high and mighty to answer somebody's comment or a direct message, then you're not, you're just a jerk, <laughs> you know? So um, what I look for is is content and entertainment, you know, really existing in your truth. If you're just yourself and you talk about what you wanna talk about and you're passionate and like Litecoin, it's good because this, top three, but they do have some pros and cons and here's why. You know, just being unbiased is very important and then giving correct information, like citing the sources. You know, education was never really my thing, which is weird because, you know, um, never went to college, you know, but then I realized how important it is because you gotta be smart, you know? 
and um, and you, you just have to really have the audience in mind. That's that's really your our focus. I feel like, yeah. So you feel you have a responsibility then to your audience to kind of put out the best content, stay honest, and stay true. And yeah, because nobody else is going to do it. We got to stand up for the community because otherwise, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Okay, I think another good question could be, uh, what do you think would be some good tips or uh, tricks, I guess you could call it, for people who want to get into uh, maybe vlogging for the first time and you know they want to get over that courage gap for the first video to maybe publicly put themselves out there? Just start. Just shoot, shoot like 200 videos. Shoot 200 videos, get your iPhone. iPhone has great sound, iPhone 8. Um, there's apps you can do, tutorials. And just three things you need to know is lighting, sound, and camera. Uh, shoot 24 frames per second if you want cinematic. Shoot 30 if you want. Just email, email that, me. That sounds so complicated, honestly. <laughs> you have an iPhone, a Samsung, download the YouTube app, live stream. Two button pushes, you have a show, you have a channel, you have a voice, use it. It's really that simple. Yeah, just do that. And I, I feel like a big misconception is when people see... Uh, influencers, they think you know they've been this good all you know their whole their whole experience. Uh, when I started out, you know it was it was rough. My first maybe 15, 20 videos were not the best. A lot of misinformation. I sounded probably like a two year old. Um, so yeah, just seriously start it, and who knows that could be the one the one moment where your life could change. I would recommend uh, starting it with small, bite-sized uh, chunks of content, like five-minute pieces even. Um, I recommend doing fat tail type searches to see what the demographics are like. Uh, so questions are really easy to start with. And ask, answer questions that you have. So like, um, you know, what is, I don't know, technical analysis? Or uh, what, is, what is Litecoin? I mean, that, that's, those types of questions, I think, uh, are often searched. You'll get a good exposure to what people are looking for and what they expect. And when you do that format, like you can write it out in, in long form, or you can go off the top of your head. There's a lot of forgivingness to it. Um, it's it's a little bit um, demanding, I think you'll find, because like you said, like 200 videos, like the more content you do, the better, and that'll give you an idea of what's required. But in a lot of ways, it's not magic. A lot of ways, it's really just perseverance. So um, that that's definitely a value. But yeah, everyone's quick to mine in this space. Everyone wants to mine, and it's like for me, like, well, why not just make content? It seems like it's cheaper and easier and more fun and rewarding. I would like to see more people do just hobbyist type stuff like that. Yeah, it's also a lot of fun being different. Like being a YouTuber is not something everyone does, and everyone here in the crypto space already does think differently. That to me was an easy transition to just be like, yeah, I'm gonna fucking make YouTube videos. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> You know, when people come and they say like they want to mine and, and you can tell they're just getting into it, I almost hear a different phrase when I hear those words. And I hear, I want to participate, right? Yeah. And people want to get involved and they want to figure out like what's the community behind it. And actually, I think that I don't know everybody's individual motivations for being here, but the fact that they're even here shows that there's some sort of community aspect to this. And in a way, we're kind of ambassadors of a community. Um, so I think it's really cool that everybody's kind of becoming into this family. So, okay, leading into the next question, um, where does this go, right? So here we are, it's 2018, soon to be 2019, we're in a bear market. Um, what's the next step in terms of not only YouTube, but crypto? Like, how does this craft evolve over the next, let's say, three to five years? I think, I mean, I'm sure everyone is going to agree, we are, you know, in the infancy. I mean, it's been going on for, what, nine years now since the beginning, but this is really the start where we figure out how we're going to develop either through YouTube or cryptocurrencies in general, uh, the, the proper route to go. And I, I feel like um, if we just keep at it, uh, just keep producing quality content, honest content, unbiased content, uh, I think we will be rewarded over time. You know, I. I think that as we are in these bear cycles, either beginning them, beginning to go into them, or in the middle of them, or whatnot, uh, liquidity becomes especially pronounced as a, a need, a requirement, and the lifeblood of any of these cryptocurrencies. So, for me, that's one of my metrics for community uh, health. It's what I like to see in anything that I'm evaluating, and I would encourage you guys to feel similarly. Uh, so I would tell you, think of ways to promote liquidity, think of ways to generate uh, utility and make price discovery more efficient. So uh, that includes uh, performing work in exchange for cryptocurrency, uh, running stores and merchant type apps, and then finding businesses that are uh, effectively um, 
promoted or able to be done with cryptocurrency. So that usually involves some kind of international payment. And it usually requires some degree of regulatory arbitrage, uh, which I, I find to be a very productive thing in this space. The little hustles that I've seen people do have just been f like phenomenally interesting at times. And it's unfortunate because they're, they're interesting because they can't be talked about. And, uh, and sometimes they're really like rote. Like there's a guy in Germany that was running this hustle with Legos where he would buy Legos in America. Yeah. And then he would uh, had this weird payment scheme where he was running the Lego arbitrage game in Germany. And, and like <laughs> it was really bizarre. But it was working for him. He was making great money. Like, like I can talk about that now. Have you heard of now. this guy that nobody really knows called Brock Pierce? That was a good hustle. That was yeah, a that was a great hustle. Yeah. <laughs> So look for anywhere that, that that kind of friction exists and see how you can promote that kind of stuff in your community. But that's where I think that everyone should be looking. Yeah, I agree. Something else, I think in the YouTube space, it's just so small. So in short, I think everything's just going to grow a ton, right? I think YouTube, we see like there's a few guys who are getting close to the 100K subscribers, which is tiny compared to any other market on YouTube. So we're still waiting for our first, you know, 100K, 200K, 300K, 500K subscriber guys. So still, still a, lo a long way to go, I think. I'm just excited about the exponential growth of all the technology that's consuming this um, dynamic arena that we're in right now. And as the show evolves, regardless if it's your show, my show, we meet each other, and then all of a sudden it turns into a different opportunity. So now, what I had planned for my week has completely changed based on this weekend's situation of meeting these awesome YouTubers. All of a sudden, the content has shifted. So to say I can sit here and say in a year I know, no idea what it's going to be, but I know I'm not going to stop producing content, and that's going to be a fun journey. That's really what it's about, is the journey, the experience. So as long as we don't give up on that, the dream of Bitcoin, Litecoin, crypto, that's not going anywhere. It's just going to get told better as time goes on. Yeah, uh, I have a different approach. I see it, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it's going to be in three to five years, but where I would like to take it is more to the mainstream in more of like a documentary. I've gotten approached by, you know, the CEO of Exodus and uh, some other really good projects like, hey, what do you feel about doing a documentary? You know, and I feel like the documentaries out there, they're very biased, you know, they're not, they don't really know how difficult it is. They don't really know anything about, you know, they, they do know stuff, but it's, it's more of like, they, they frame it in a way where the public views it as a scam and I don't, it's not. You know, so I want to shoot a documentary. Yeah, I actually want to take a little soapbox moment because that point hit really close to home. It's that everybody seems to be giving their power away. And do you know what I mean by this? It seems like everybody's looking for an expert and everybody's like looking upwards in some kind of like, I don't know, socially in some sort of situation. There's no like upwards to look. I think everybody's just making this up as they go along, right? Everybody's, it's true, right? I mean, everybody, I, I, that's what I'm doing right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Reselling. What's that? Well, I mean, or just be making it without faking it as you go, right? So I think that literally everybody's inventing this uh, ecosystem as we move forward. But as YouTubers, as influencers, like we're sharing as we learn, right? And that's a vulnerable position, at least for me, um, because we admit that we don't know everything. But the danger comes when people pretend like they do know things, and that's what you were talking about with the people on the pedestal. So what is a way then, do you think that people can kind of take back their own autonomy, right? Keep your own private keys, like that's the whole motto that we have going. So really, how do you think we can kind of like um, break down the idols that are always created, especially around this thing like cryptocurrency, right? This magic thing that nobody understands except the experts, you know? I think that's the cool part about like m making content on YouTube is that it's a lot more personal to everyone. So like, you make your video and then you'll have someone come up to you and they'll be like, oh, I watched your video. I know this story. I know that story. I heard a ton of like a ton of the guys talking about some guy come up to them and just share something that they mentioned in a video. And so it's a lot more like a lot more of a closer relationship. Yeah. And there's always going to be guys that try and pretend that they're like the experts. But I think it's pretty easy to like if, if they say they're if, if they say they know everything, probably don't listen to them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, th I think the most important thing is to create a movement and help. Um, I say that because, uh, for example, you know, the first conference I attended to speak at, uh, there was a guy named uh, Crypto Cats from Chicago. Never been on a plane before. Got him a free ticket, flew out, just introduced him to all the speakers, had him sit with us, made his day. Now he's making movie. He's making uh, uh, stuff on YouTube. Another kid, he's a 10-year-old special, you know, special ed, and he didn't know how to do it. 
So I said, I'll produce his first video. You know, stuff like that. Just like helping them start and then they can take the training wheels off. Then they'll be their own autonomized channel. Chris, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, one thing I hate to, it, I have to phrase this very carefully. I think a lot of the sort of Oracle mentality has really come out of the Bitcoin camp specifically. I'm sorry. Yeah, and um, I, I get how we got there, but there's like these, these sort of like titans of Bitcoin uh, that have it all figured out. And it's unfortunate because the way that that community has progressed at this point is it's, there's not a lot of experimentation being done there. And there's a lot of obedience, uh, which is weird because like the, it started off with Liberty and now it's become a very obedient group. That's very true. And yeah, and I don't know that that's very productive. And I, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin is bad. It doesn't mean Bitcoin's going anywhere. It may just be that that's the most conservative sector of the community. And I think even here at the Litecoin Summit, that's particularly apt because uh, all of these communities are going to start competing, I think, in ways that Bitcoin does not want to compete. And so it's kind of nice. It's kind of like a harmony, even, in that I think we, we have the opportunity here to form coalitions and groups and unions in ways uh, that, as peers, we can uh, maybe achieve a greater success than Bitcoin. I don't know. I don't want to say it like that, but it's possible. And it's, you know what, it's, I, I think, a, a good time for that in the space because uh, we had the civil war in Bitcoin and the factions started and... <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Bitcoiners aren't really, like the rote Bitcoin maximalist types aren't really out anymore, and their strategy is to stay home and bunker down, and I don't think that's a good strategy. Yeah, actually, I'm curious. Did most of you guys get your on-ramp into crypto from Bitcoin, or did you start with another coin that led you to finding more information? So raise your hand if it was Bitcoin first. Okay, yeah, so everybody here kind of got on-ramp And that's great, Bitcoin. yeah. But then it seems like everyone bought Bitcoin to buy the next thing. And I think that as liquidity improves at exchanges, we're going to see that less and less pronounced. Because my suspicion is that the people who bought Bitcoin did so because they wanted to transfer to like Binance or something, and they would have just as soon put like an ACH payment straight into what they wanted and had less risk. Mm -hmm. So I as long as Bitcoin has that power, then Bitcoin will be fine. And if that gets to a road, then not that we would want that to happen, but at least we would have nice uh, fail safes and contingency plans. And then even still, maybe something works here. Um, in the Litecoin space or what have you. And then in Bitcoin, that becomes the standard as a result of that practice succeeding. So uh, that's, you know, for me, that's what I kind of want to see in this phase right now. It's a power vacuum that is opened up. Anybody else have thoughts on this? What I always suggest to my mom and her 60-year-old plus friends who are always harping on me to teach them about crypto is don't go on YouTube and look for the person with the most viewers and the most subscribers. Look for the person that you understand clearly. Very simple. Because if your mom is, my mom is from Central America, English is not her first language, didn't do education the proper route, I don't want to sit there and take the time to explain everything to her. But I guarantee you there's someone on YouTube who's already put that message out there perfectly. Just search a little bit longer and it'll be worth it. Beautiful. Uh, okay, so I guess since we were on the topic of uh, currencies and civil wars and all that, everybody has a, and you mentioned the word narrative earlier, right? Everybody has their own individual narrative that they've created in their minds. That's like how they think this is going to play out. And I want to go one by one down the panel and just like, you know, entertain us, regale us with a story. How do you think this is going to play out? Um... I think, now this is just following it, of course, I think we're going to experience these sort of waves every single year for mo multiple years to come where, you know, we have these highs, we have these lows, and it's going to be like a roller coaster. Um, a matter of when it gets stable, no one can determine. I think maybe like around 2025 would be a good time frame to say, all right, volatility slowing down. This is a good point where whether you want to cash out or stay in uh, to make a decision on your investments. Uh, but personally for me, like when it comes to like price predictions, um, I'm thinking maybe 25K for a Bitcoin around January of 2020. You oh cheap miser. <laughs> realistic. 25K. We're not here for 25K. I know, but you, you got to be realistic. We're going to get a new Corolla. <laughs> you got to be realistic. You got to look at the adoption. It is coming in. We have these institutions coming in, and that's awesome to see. Um, so I think it's going to be a little longer than we all want, but it's going to be worth it. I need to hear some moon juice. Somebody, please. Anybody. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a realistic guy. Oh, God. Sorry. I can't predict price, but I, I can, I think, predict some of the activity that we'll see, which I think, 
You never know with price because the price is people. You never know what whale comes in and sees this and, and likes it, or maybe some someone gets divorced and then money leaves. I mean, the, the price is like loosely coupled to progress, uh, but not directly coupled. So that's always hard for me. But I can I can talk about where I think the progress will be made. And what's evident to me is that there's been a number of phases in this space. Uh, we we've had a phase of. Uh, the gold bugs, uh, which were early years in Bitcoin, and they entered the simulation of gold bugging. Uh, we then had a phase of IPO simulation, where people entered into this sort of ring of others that are a uh, IPO emulating crowd, and they created the ICO stuff. And we had the same thing with private blockchains, I think, where there was like this enterprise consulting phase. And what's evident to me is that throughout all of these, there's some things that have been true. Uh, blockchain technology is the production of bearer instruments. Uh, and I th it's, think it's that bearer instruments create social forms. These social forms are things that we know um, in our regular world, things like uh, governments, borders, uh, and, and various forms of ideas that only exist in the minds of men. They don't necessarily exist otherwise, and they're created He means out people, people. Yes. <laughs> but my but we're in San I forgot Francisco. The, <laughs> forgot the room we're in. Um, so, so I think that if we embrace that more... The minds <laughs> of people. <laughs> You have to watch the crowds. Um, Gender is yeah, so a I, social construct, remember? Yes. Well, I mean, hey, social construct would work in this theme, you know? Like, uh, borders are social constructs, and they exist because of uh, the power structures endemic to the people that are creating bearer instruments. Uh, the U.S. dollar works in this capacity. And it seems that there's very much a need online for these types of institutions. Uh, people are begging for it in many ways, uh, either through moderation of Twitter or video games or even all kinds of things we don't understand around those themes. So I think that what's nice about the cryptocurrency space is that these little groups have a very good chance of creating rules and processes that uh, affirm some group identity and that create social form online. And I think that the communities that do that best are probably going to be the ones that take this to the next level. And I don't know if it'll be another simulation after that or what. I don't even know if the dollar is at this point uh, an exception to any of this. It may just be that the We're dollar living blockchain in a simulation, bro. Yeah, no, I, I see it. It's very, it's it's always funny because in this space, I'll see something and I'll be like, wait a minute, and then I'll go to look to see how we do it in the real world. And I'll be like, it's no different, and then I, I don't know where I end up. Yeah, it's really like creating this own alternative little ecosystem where we make the same mistakes that we made before, but just do it in crypto. Okay, next, uh, I think a lot of people are going to learn through making a lot of mistakes. Uh, that's what I think the next five years, the next 10 years are going to come through. It's going to be realizing that you don't just throw your money into any ICO and expect it to 100x. Uh, we saw a lot of that happen, and people, hopefully, they learn from their mistakes, and hopefully we're not going to have that same thing happen again, even though probably we'll have some of it. But uh, I think, yeah, I, th I think people are going to learn through making mistakes, and hopefully in time we're going to start treating this like we do anything else in the financial sector, just like you treat it, any other currency, any other financial investment, Searching it the same. I would like a price prediction, please. One billion dollars. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Correct answer. I mean, in see in that 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 was too though. high. I didn't like that. We got to come down a little bit. But it, it depends on what year. Like, what, what, like how close are you talking about? Price okay, price. sure. We can do uh, two points uh, by the end of the year, just for fun, and then let's say by twenty twenty two. The next happening. Next happening. I think the next happening we could see. I Man, I can't like. A lot, uh, like if you judge it by like you heard the, it here first. Breaking news: a lot. <laughs> I mean, if what's you price like going to be? Trends, a lot. <laughs> I mean, by you, now, <laughs> many. If Corollas. you check out the previous trends, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of people talk about like John McAfee's a million dollar prediction by twenty twenty. Yeah. It's a lot, but I don't know if it's necessarily out of the question in like. It's not looking good for time. Little McAfee, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, not by his year, but I, I mean, I think the price is possible. Just maybe not as soon as he thinks it's going to happen. Awesome. I think, uh, just shout out to Ken Bozak from earlier. I think he is completely right on what he's talking about is utilization of crypto on a daily basis is what's going to allow prices to get where we would like them to be, more or less. Uh, but then also to your point, it's, it's like we're reconstructing an economic forum just in a digital world. It's not going to go anywhere until it's useful. So until we're all using it to buy cheapo air tickets and we're all paying Uber and whatever. Then we'll start to see prices at a very healthy price, at a healthy place. Until then, it's just like going and getting euros and switching them to dollars and then to Bitcoin. I don't see an entire purpose until I can buy something with it, until I can use it. When that happens, then the price will be 
so phenomenal. But a million, I don't know. Two million in time, sure. Yeah. But it needs that one application, that one dApp that's going to separate everyone. And you're not even going to know you're using cryptocurrencies. That's all of a sudden, exactly, the dApp life, boost. So, like, whatever it is, one dApp away, and that's going to be the one that just takes over the market. It's. I think you just gave me the name of my next song, One Dap Away. I'm only one. <laughs> you just got to give yeah. me a shout out if you do it. You trying to do a collab on that? What's that? You want to try to do a collab on that song? Yeah, let's do a collab. It's like, uh, I'm only one dap, dap away. away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we need, we need like a really adopted. cool Asian guy to do the chorus, you know, like one. Yeah. T-Pain. Oh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, every, everybody going to buy Corollas? Corollas. Yeah. <laughs> Chevy, yeah, Whoa. yeah. Um, That's a man with good taste. Over there. I, I had an answer, but oh well. Um, I think I think just using it, like uh, like me and my cousin, like sometimes like, hey, you want to go to Litecoin or something? He's like, I don't know. Well, I'll give you like 0.5 F, you know, and then just like just scan the QR code. Just using it. Um, price prediction, I noticed that, uh, I have no idea, but um, I noticed that crypto is the only market that is a world currency, and it also is 24 hours, and it also is not linear. It's logarithmic. So if it hit 1,000 in 2000, uh, 2012 or 2014, and then the next having 2016, and then hit 10 grand, the next one would be 100. Nice. Okay, so we have a few more minutes left. Uh, you have a Q&A time. Um, you have access to the best and brightest minds <laughs> in all the cryptocurrency on this panel. So guys, questions? Okay, I want to hear uh, what was the most memorable comment, either incredibly offensive oh boy. Or, or just outlandish that you've had on a video thus far. Just anything that comes to mind. Yeah, the most memorable was nothing outlandish. It was a very nice comment. Uh, if you go to um, YouTube and you type in Coin Daddy Charlie, I did a song where I parodied Eminem's Stan, uh, and I wrote it like a disgruntled Litecoin holder saying, Dear Charlie, uh, I DM'd you, but you still ain't tweeting and all this stuff. Um, and how about how he sold his coins at the top? Well, let's not talk about that anymore. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but someone posted the first comment. They said, Coin Daddy, this is the most prolific thing I have seen since Weird Al Yankovic is white and nerdy. And I, I thought that was the nicest thing I'd ever heard. To be compared to white and nerdy is, is a great comment. Yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of much, but uh, probably just a nice comment was probably on one of my uh, my uh, Binance tutorial videos of just like a 70-year-old woman just commenting below how I'm helping her get into it, you know, understand it and stuff like that. So that's probably just a wow. rather I could, basic. That was a lame answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my oh, that thumbs up on I got this. one time on one of my videos. That's dope. <laughs> I loved every one of those thumbs. <laughs> I could probably clear out this room with the negative comments that I've received. I'm going to spare you guys some of the worst of them. I think you, as YouTubers, you'll see that people get drunk and then they write these things. And then like you look at it, and you're like, this makes no sense. Uh, they're rarely good, although sometimes they are. I got called uh, recently the pseudo Socrates, which I thought was really interesting because I didn't know that anyone thought that I was the real Socrates. And apparently, <laughs> it's been discovered that I'm the fake Socrates. <laughs> I didn't know I was presenting myself as Socrates. You, you kind of have that. a Socratic air about you. I, I guess so. I, I'm even flattered by it because I didn't think I did until he said that I wasn't the real Socrates. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I'm that good. Uh, I think, I mean, yeah, there's a ton of hate comments all the time. But I think some of the best ones that I've had was somebody who said that they thought, like, they thought something was one way. And then through the information I provided, they realized that that's not really how it worked. That's not really how things were. And so I opened their eyes to that. I think that's the most rewarding thing. To me. Nice. Uh, hey, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I will vividly recall um, one very mean comment I got, and it was, how come you don't know every single cryptocurrency that's out there if you're on YouTube telling me about this one specific one? There's 1,900 and yeah. growing. <laughs> yeah. There's absolutely no way that any one of us here can know every single one of them, and I don't want to even claim to know, but that was an insight to to just go, oh, wow, your harshest critic is going to hit you with something kind of mean. And all of a sudden, I started researching more and more and more and realizing I'm oversaturating my thought process now with a bunch of BS crypto that I don't need. So that 
mean comment actually helped my channel uh, kind of fixate on cryptos that I love. Not that I'm trying to help anyone find out. These are things that I love that I hope maybe you guys think are cool over time. Yeah, the worst comment I got was, uh, get the out of here with that Monopoly money. <laughs> and uh, I responded, uh, bro, I got a Corolla. No, <laughs> no, I didn't respond. Hashtag Corolla life. <laughs> yeah, right? I tap away. Um, yeah, and then some of the, the better ones are kind of like, um, thank you, I understand. That's that's all you really need to know. Like, thank you. I learned something. Do we have time for another question, Adam? Hey, uh, Patrick. I think I got a new nickname for you. You can call yourself the real Socrates. The re <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I had a uh, just quick question about the psychology a little bit behind, uh, you know, the holiday season because last year was when it really ramped up crazy. I was just curious. Wanted to pick your brains about the possibility of that happening again around the same time because I've just had this the sensation that it could, but I would like, you know, just some ideas. Uh, I believe it has zero effect on the market at all, to be honest. I think it has a huge effect on the market. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do. I think uh, around... I think around that time, you know... I'm uh, not staring him down. I, I'm just curious. <laughs> what? Tell me why. There's not a fight that's about to happen. I was just listening. <laughs> no, I think around, like, Thanksgiving time, Christmas time, New Year's, I think it does have maybe not as large of an, uh, of an effect that we think it does. Uh, but, you know, the psychology of, you know, family sitting down at dinner, you know, you have that one weird uncle talking about it. Everyone wants to get involved. Everyone wants to make money. I think also that's time when we have tax season, tax returns, um, you know, Christmas. Someone wants to learn about crypto, gift crypto or whatever. So I think it does play a pretty big effect. The question was whether or not bonuses affect the price, uh, Christmas season bonuses. Yeah, he, yeah. he was asking That's how right. much this season affects the price of crypto. Yeah, there's also like football season that starts in Sunday, I, or no, Super Bowl that starts uh, right afterwards that I think a lot of people are participating in and using cryptocurrency to make bets and such on. I think that had an effect in years prior and then that got baked into the price a bit. And I think that in like 17, bonuses probably had an outsized effect. And I would imagine that the market would bake that in now in 18 to some degree. But uh, I do think it matters, and uh, who knows how much or if that pattern can be expected once it's been produced. I'm a, the finance is fun, but generally means that we know nothing. My experience. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's obviously it's possible. I think if you judge like the human psychology, it could be something that happens just because people expect it to happen. Um, that might be one of the reasons for it. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably how I'm gonna answer that. I, I think it's um, important because we get a chance to sit down with our close loved ones in those times and actually have very close, kind of delicate conversations because it's not comfortable to talk to your family about money all the time, especially if they're thinking, like, why does my son want to talk about money? Does he want something? No, 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 I'm trying to teach you something. Last Christmas was a lot of people getting excited. I expect this Christmas a lot of people are saying, I told you. You, you know that's going to happen. So I almost think this season's going to have a negative effect because you're going to get scolded a lot. Oh, I lost money because of you. Each year, the cycle will continue. Does it really matter? No, it doesn't. I don't think the season has anything to do with it at all. I think that the timing of bringing family together to openly talk is just a consequence of the time. Uh, I do think the seasons matter um, because now we're on a world level and... Uh, what I've been seeing is, well, two things. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, in Asia, they play a huge part, and there's Chinese New Year. So every year before Chinese New Year, they just, you got to spend money for your family. That's like their Christmas. They don't have Christmas. So you got Korea, you got, you know, China, billion of people, you know, and they, they pull out to go on vacation with their family, and then that's when, you know, it'll go down. Um, it's happened the, five, the past five years in a row. And uh, another thing would be, um, fake news. So fake news. People use like China puts out fake news all the time. Don't believe it. They're they're, you know, they're my people, but <laughs> don't believe it because they're just causing fud. Everyone sells, and then everyone, the, the individual investor gets hurt, not not them, and then they just buy back in. Um, and then also Moore's law. You know, uh, if you guys know about that, how the rate of you know computing power doubles every 1.5 years. So if you keep that into account, then you should be able to understand where it's going to go, technologically speaking. Yeah. 
I just think there are bull markets and there are bear markets. And if you're in a bear market, there's really nothing that's going to move it back to the bull market unless it decides it's the time to go back to the bull market. So something like an American events, right, like Christmas or holidays, I don't think is really going to affect a global market, like you said, as much. Uh, but it probably helped accelerate it last year. I, I do contend that. One thing I do think the space needs more of is like an indexing approach. I will say that. Yeah. Um, because I think that like everyone wants to time the market right now, and I don't think that's a great strategy. I think that what should actually perform best for any one person over time is like $100 a paycheck or something, or every four weeks you put some money in. And I'd like to see that start, start to even out some of the, the market. And there are products coming out that are helping us do that that I'm very excited about. Very cool. Yep. So this is going to be the last question for you guys. Fantastic panel, by the way. I love seeing YouTubers come together and collaborate. And I love seeing you walk and talk. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skillful. <laughs> because you guys reach a lot of people. Uh, my mailman, my mother, my girlfriend, they all get their cryptocurrency information from YouTube. Uh, if they're going to start using it, this is going to get mass adopted. And if blockchain as a whole is going to take the next step, it starts with you guys. And the more you collaborate, the more you team up, the more people you reach, and the quicker we can further mass adoption. So to end the panel, I would like to start at Nathan, and that's right. <laughs> Say something nice about the person to your right. Are you doing this again? <laughs> Deep into my eyes, bro. I'm, I'm trying not to say anything that would, you know, become very uh, sensual. So I'll just uh, nice hat, bro. <laughs> the Bulldog Cafe, guys, is an amazing place. Go visit. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Patrick Corsino right here. This young man is one of the most intelligent people I've got a chance to speak with this weekend. Um, it's really surprising because you'll walk up to someone and have an idea of what they're going to be like on, on YouTube. As soon as I see one, someone on YouTube, I, have a, I mentally pick point who I think they are. When you chat with these people right here, especially this young dude, he's so damn smart. I'm I'm just gonna have to pick his brain as much as he'll let me. So, you're gonna Appreciate get a it. lot of emails, bro. <laughs> um, so oh, he's been around for a very long time in Chris. Bitcoin. Uh, what year? Like 2011? Yeah, 2011. 2011. So really, really smart. Really cool to see what it's been like the journey for him. I think that's probably what I've enjoyed most talking to him is just seeing what like the experiences he's had because he's been through the bulls and the bears plenty of times. The old man of blockchain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're new. <laughs> Hello. Uh, but you're from Florida, which I really appreciate. I think uh, bringing that swamp pride out on the YouTube, it's worth I'm not, I'm not a redneck. I can... Oh, well, you, you can develop it a little bit on camera. Feel it out. It exists in all of us at some level. <laughs> Gotta get on an ATV, maybe. Feel the wind in your face. Yeah. Wear a wife beater. Try it out. See, I don't know. Florida's not like that. <laughs> parts of it, parts of it. <laughs> No, I mean, the energy you've brought has been wonderful. And you're, you're in school still. I my hope would be that you uh, perhaps take the lessons of your education, bring it into the space a little bit more, uh, because you seem like you have a lot of potential there. And yeah. Thank you. No problem. Coin daddy. <laughs> I like your beard. Thank you. Um, That's it. <laughs> no, seriously, coin daddy, he makes music videos, stuff like that. He's a jokester. Uh, but don't let this guy fool you. He's a very smart man. I had a simple ride in a van over here with him earlier, and uh, I honestly learned a lot just sitting there and having him talk about a couple stuff, so he, uh, he's a smart guy. He's also learned my social security number, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Nathan, uh, we started off we, I don't, with nothing, I guess, and then somewhere along the way on the stage, in between your ramblings and ums and pauses, when you threw out that idea for one dap away, I knew we had a connection. And I just, my respect levels are like through the roof. I'm like a Adam Draper right now. So excited! All right! Yeah, man, I'm gonna buy some orange pants and I'm gonna think about you when I do it. Why orange? Adam, Adam. Draper only wears orange pants. And he just bought a second pair recently. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. and uh, to Coin Daddy, thank you very much. You've been great. I really appreciate you. You rock. All right, guys, thank you Thanks for everyone. listening. <laughs> yeah. Cryptocurrency, crypto, crypto. I see yo, I see yo. FOMO, FOMO. Lightning Network to the moon we go. Yeah. Here's my Lambo. Here you go. 
can't block blockchain. Nah, nah. It's immutable, irrefutable, indisputable. Top rank, top rank. Top rank. Call me agile, agile. Anti fragile. Yeah. Oh, you got skin in the game. For real? Let me know where you at now. Where you at, man? Crypto winter time.